uh, I'm very happy to introduce our final speaker today. Uh, Michael Carbon is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and the leader of the Programming Systems Group. Michael will be speaking about the lottery ticket hypothesis, finding sparse trainable neural networks. Please join me in welcoming Michael. Thank you for the introduction. So yeah, so today, so as, as I was introduced, uh, my name is Michael Carbon. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, the work that we've been doing in my group, along with some of my collaborators, on training small, sparse neural networks, uh, with one of the, the core hopes of our work uh, being able to tackle many of the issues that we have with you know, performance issues, cost issues that are associated with needing to train incredibly large neural networks. So you know, as context and motivation, um, let's actually you know, start with, let's say what I'd call the obvious, right? Which is that neural networks are, you know, are quite large. And in fact, they're, they are quite massive, right? So in the space of natural language processing, which is you know, one space where we are clearly pushing the capabilities and limits of uh, modern computational platforms that we're using in, in deep learning, you know, we are seeing incredibly large models. So GPT-2, which came out, I believe it was last year at this point, was a 1.5 billion parameter model. Um, but of course, this is now out of date, looking at some of the, the latest results that have come out from GPT-3, another model in this space of natural language processing, where we're looking at 175 billion parameter model, right? And just to quantify this as cost, you're talking about a model that's taking 350, 350 gigabytes of memory to actually uh, work with. Um, and as well as you're looking at training costs that are in the you know the tens of millions of dollars. I mean, even just for you know, single or limited model runs, right? So this is this is excessive, you know, excessively large, and, there, and there's really no end in sight. You know, there's a dramatic improvement going from GPT-2 to GPT-3, and you know these teams are looking at trillion parameter models and beyond, right? So so what do we do, right? So you know, this is clearly going to be a very interesting frontier in getting state-of-the-art capabilities. But at the end of the day, we still want to think about how to bring these excessively large models into to the hands of more entities than just the largest players in the space, um, and, the, and in many different contexts and capabilities. So for both training, um, or for both inference and as well as training. So on the inference side, so let me let me start to get into some background, particularly starting with some background around how we think about uh, model compression, or a term called pruning. Um, all designed to make networks small for inference. And from there, I'll work back into the results that we have for thinking about training. How can we think about training smaller neural networks even from the get-go? So as background, you know, pruning, if you, if you aren't familiar with this, with, with this concept, at least the neural network space, uh, the idea is that you can take these large networks that we have and actually throw away superfluous parts. Right? And this is an old concept that has you know, significant history going back in literature back into the late 80s. Uh, as well, and the early 90s, uh, where you see papers such as the, you know, the optimally titled Optimal Brain Damage and other related work at the time. Uh, and more recently, so in 2015, Song Hong, who is now a professor at MIT, but was formerly at Stanford doing his PhD when he did this work, uh, when he demonstrated that these old techniques were still relevant for modern day networks, and if anything, more relevant, where there was a great opportunity to reduce the size of these models by over an order of magnitude. So, how does this work? How, do, how does pruning work? Well, pruning works like this. So I've got my cartoon of a neural network sitting up here uh, where I have my circles of neurons and then my uh, lines, my colored lines as weights. You know, these are gonna be my connections between neurons that I have. And so at the outset of your, trash, of your classic deep learning pipeline, what you're gonna do is you're going to randomly initialize this structure, uh, randomly initialize the weights of this structure uh, first. And that's your first step. So or step zero. So step one is then we're gonna train our neural network. So we're gonna apply you know, standard gradient-based learning techniques and you know, stochastic gradients descent as is typically the case this in this uh, in, in current regimes. And what we'll do is you'll take your data set, apply stochastic gradient descent and arrive or converge finally at some network that's at accuracy that's sufficient for your particular application and task. So next in pruning, you're gonna remove superfluous structure. So what does superfluous structure mean? Well, so what is structure? So this can be a wide variety of different things. It can just be individual weights in a very unstructured characteristic where I'm gonna take individual weights out of my large neural network. It could be structured more uh, coarsely around neurons. We can take out whole neurons. 
uh, or moving into the specific architectures that you're using for your particular problem, you may have a domain specific architecture. So there's a convolutional network and therefore you'd be looking at removing things like filters and channels. So all of these work. I mean, they're at, at different, at, uh, at varying ex uh, extents of success. Uh, and, but there's, there's literature, a wide variety of literature on each of these different techniques. And in our work, what I'm gonna talk about, primarily gonna talk about removing individual weights. Now, superfluous, what does it mean for something to be superfluous? Well, there are many ways to measure this as well. For example, in the weight context, it could just be that these magnitudes are small. The magnitudes, your, your weights are small. Or it could be that the gradients falling on your particular weight are, are small as well, suggesting that they are you know, the network and its loss is relatively insensitive to the given specific values there. Uh, or there could be other measures, other measures depending on the granularity that you're gonna choose. In this work, I'm gonna talk about magnitudes. Right? So now, so remove. So this is something that I didn't talk about you know, so precisely before, but to remove, what this means in this context is to simply set, let's say a weight to zero. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take these large weights and for example, if we're using a magnitude pruning type heuristic, you're gonna set the smallest fraction of those to zero. Um, and then after you that, typically, this is where you're gonna get to step three, where typically once you make this removal procedure or take this removal action, you're gonna find that your network loses some accuracy. And so at that step, there's a fine tuning process where you essentially take your standard training regime curtail it a bit, add some more data, and improve the accuracy of that final model. And depending on how small you make this model, uh, you're very likely to recover the accuracy of the original model. And then finally, it's a minor step, you can iteratively repeat this process to get smaller and smaller networks as you go down in steps. And as the result, so if you look in the literature, so this is an, an older slide coming from Song's paper in 2015, uh, where again, one of these first cases of these results again being revived in our modern networks you know, at the time in 2015, but what we're seeing are networks that are just as accurate as their original counterparts, and they're an order of magnitude smaller, right? So in the inference context where I'm taking a network, I've fully trained a network, I want to deploy that, uh, I'm going to you know, prune it and deploy it, you know, perhaps into mobile or even just for serving inference from the cloud where you can get substantial improvements and model size, uh, which is going to have you know, impact on, uh, let's say the memory system and memory organization that you have, as well as communication, uh, or you can even get significant just computational improvements. So improved latency or throughput uh, that you're gonna have in this model. All right, so this is, this is predominantly been you know, a very interesting observation and interesting result that showed up in the past several years in the space when you're looking for good performance uh, in the inference setting. Now, as I mentioned, you know, going back to the title of this talk, we're interested in training. You know, this is about inference, but what about that initial training phase? And as I described it thus far, you're just going to train your network as is normal. And the question is, you know, can can we do better? And of course, you know, training is expensive. You know, I don't. I think for this audience, many people are, are aware of the, of the associated costs that are coming with training these any networks and certainly large neural networks where you're going into, let's say your cloud providers and finding that there are significant costs associated with keeping your platforms and training apparatuses running. Right? And in fact, you know, training is not only just expensive, but there are motivations for when we'd want training. Um, when we're thinking about, for example, privacy in the federated learning model where we'd like to be able to deploy networks um, across different platforms, you know, at the edge, be able to do that type of learning at the edge remotely so users don't need to disclose their data, don't need to upload it centrally to some specific, let's say, a centralized training cluster of some stripe. And instead we can preserve privacy by uh, letting um, users out on the edge actually retain control over their data. So this is another motivation for why we might want smaller or more efficient networks that can train just as well. Right, and really the, you know, the, the research question or problem that we're coming into here is, well, if we can train, if we can prune models after training, can we just train smaller networks or smaller models from the start? And there's this core question between representation, because obviously these smaller networks can represent an equally accurate function as the trained original network, but, but what about optimization? How well can these smaller networks optimize? Uh, and classically, there have been, been challenges uh, with training small neural networks. And so in this result, and the work that I wanted to talk to you about is some work that we had in iClear last year, uh, we have shown that it's actually, it's possible to find 
um, subnetworks of these large networks that actually do tra train just as well as the original. And there are then some open challenges of how we might then find these efficiently uh, and go about accelerating training as I've been hoping for and, and been describing. And I'll return to that at the end of the talk. But to get into just the meat of these results and, uh, and to demonstrate what we've been seeing in our observations, first, I just want to talk a bit about what we see for small networks. I'm call these small networks from the get-go, thinking about uh, NNES and CIFAR style networks, and then generalize a little bit later to the results that we've been seeing in broader and larger contexts. So here, so going back to our, our question, you know, can we train a small, you know, neural network or small sparse neural network from scratch? Well, if you want to investigate that question, a, a, a clear experiment that you might run is exactly this. So we're going to take our standard random initialization strategy, but now just apply it to a smaller model, to a sparse pruned model, then we're going to train it, right? In a standard setup, this is what you, you would try if you want to test this hypothesis right out or outright. Now, unfortunately, this does not reach the same accuracy. And you know, this has been shown time and time again in the literature, where, for example, here, uh, training a pruned model from scratch performs worse than retraining a pruned model, which may indicate the difficulty of training a, a network with small capacity. Um, and this is this the small part, right? This this last part of this phrase is the key observation where you know the modern understanding in neural networks is we're looking at these large overparameterized representations. Uh, many more parameters than data points. And via this process, very simple gradient-based optimization methods are able to produce high-quality models that also surprisingly do not overfit for the data that we have at hand. And so this has been you know, the, the observation, is this is what we have seen and, and has been understood. right? And similarly, it's been shown in other ways in the literature as well. Now, so what's our observation here? So our observation, when we've been looking at these results, is as follows. What we can say, it's basically, if you run this pruning process as I described, sort of the, uh, the weights that survive or the weights that you prune at the end of training, these things actually could have been pruned before training and you would have done just as well. And the key observation here is that you need to keep the original initialization. So instead of just taking a small sparse neural network, randomly initializing it and trying to train it, the way we're finding this is by actually looking at this sparse structure at the end and backporting it to this original random initialization that we started the training process with. And what that gets us to is that within that large neural network, we find that there's some small subnetwork that actually would have trained just as well uh, as the larger neural network. So, okay. So now let's try and show you how this procedure works, you know, how we've actually gone about demonstrating that these exist. So here, so this is a procedure and I flashed it on the previous slide called iterative magnitude pruning. And it's just ever so slightly a refinement of the, of the standard pruning framework that we saw. But the basic idea is we're gonna start just as we did before. We're going to randomly initialize our full network. We're then going to train it using our standard technique, but then gonna prune it using our, our standard setup, you know, the standard heuristics that we were using before, pruning individual weights by magnitude and setting their values to zero, right? And then, so instead of continuing our training process at this point, as we had done in a normal pruning setup, where we do this fine tuning phase and we just add more new data from this given initialization that we found, what we're gonna do is we're gonna backport this mask, the structure that we found and actually reset our weights back to the original initialization that we had started off with this whole process in, in step one, right? And then what we can do is we can do this iteratively, iteratively until we find a smaller network, a smaller sub-network within this original network that we actually started with. So this is the process that we've been using, very you know simple process that we've been using here to identify these things. And the results that we find are, we find these sparse trainable subnetworks, meaning that they train just as well as the large one uh, for a variety of you know, different tasks. So here I'm talking about MNIST and CIFAR, but even in this context, we've looked at a wide variety, a variety of different optimizers, different architecture, different layers, um, anything, you know, a lot of the standard things that we're seeing, let's say in the vision space, we've been able to apply these to. Uh, and as well, you know, even since then, we've started to look in, you know, NLP and others have actually started to look at results in reinforcement learning and other domains, right? And the, and the key observation here again is if you reinitialize, so if you just try to 
just randomly choose one of these small sparse networks, it's, it's just not gonna work well. So more facts. So these networks are about the same size. They are the same size as you get from the standard pruning process. So even though we are resetting these networks all the way back to initialization, their size, the effective size, are, are just as good as if we had you know, continued this trading process using standard pruning. And I'll return to this a little later on in the talk as well. These networks, you find they actually learn faster than the original network, uh, and they reach the same or higher test accuracy. So those are you know, two interesting observations that we've seen. Now, caveats here. So I'll explain some results in a second. The caveats here, you saw, we're, we're finding these retroactively. right? So we're doing this iterative process to find the subnetwork. Um, and finding this, doing this, is very expensive. It's not efficient at the moment, but our goals going forward and what the community is working on is actually finding better techniques for that. And I'll revisit that in a moment. Uh, and then finally, looking at, as I said before, these smaller vision tasks and networks. So to understand these results a bit better, let's look, a, look at some graphs. So here, uh, what I'm showing you is a standard training curve for uh, a simple fully connected model inside of MNIST. Uh, and so what we're plotting here is number of iterations, number of iterations of SGD, so over our, our normal process, it's gonna be on our x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we're looking at the test accuracy at any given point during training. And so this, this blue line here that says 100 next to it, this is with, uh, 100% of the weights remaining. So no pruning has happened, nothing. This is our standard learning curve. So now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna bring in new curves where we're gonna look at smaller subnetworks and observe their behavior. So these are subnetworks that we've identified using our procedure. So the first one is gonna be 51.3%. So this is gonna be half the size of this network. And so what are we seeing? So we are seeing a little bit improved convergence. It's getting to higher accuracy, test accuracy a little bit more quickly than the original network. Uh, we are also seeing that it's reaching roughly the same accuracy as well. Now, if we take an additional step and make this smaller, getting down to 21.1% of the weights, we see a little bit more improved convergence and a little bit higher accuracy as well. Now, of course, this can't go on forever. Now, when we get down to 3.6% of the weights, we see now, we're learning just as fast um, up to the same accuracy as the original network, but we are now over an order of magnitude smaller than this original network that we had. Now, of, of course, as I mentioned, this can't go on forever. So if we get down to 1.9% of the size of the network, this is a case where now we've lost too much capacity to train, to learn in the network. Uh, and therefore, now we're starting to see us fall off of the curve that was set by our original network. So now, let's take a look at what happens when we reinitialize and, and just compare and contrast these results. So this is again our 100% line. This is our 51.3% line. And now I'm gonna bring in a dashed line that's gonna show you what happens when you randomly reinitialize this network instead of retaining or finding a subnetwork with inside of the original network. And so we can see there's a gap that opens up. And the smaller you make this network, actually, the larger the gap becomes with the reinitialized network actually not doing as well as the original. And so I'm gonna change presentation format for a, a second, show you these results more clearly. We're here, this is a different presentation, summarizing a lot of the results that we're seeing before with some additional results as well. But let's, let's see, so what we're showing here is on this left-hand graph, uh, we're seeing percentage of weights remaining is gonna be on the x-axis. X -axis. On the y-axis, we're looking at the number of iterations it takes to converge. So this is using just a standard early stopping heuristic that we have in place. Um, and so what now we're plotting is then how long it takes to converge is a function of the, of the weights remaining, the size of the network that we have. On this right-hand side, we're gonna plot accuracy as a function of the weights remaining. And so this is gonna be a summary of some of the points of curves, multiple curves that we saw in the last part. So let's take a look at these results, right? So on the right side here, what we can see is as we make this network smaller using original net, so this is using our technique, what you see is accuracy improves a little bit as the network gets smaller, as we saw in those previous graphs. And then of course, eventually tails off around 3.6% as we saw it before. Now on the left hand of the side, we get a better summary of the improved learning that we saw in some of the previous results. But what we see is that when we go to the left, making the network smaller, we get a slight improvement in convergence, and then eventually, we can see once we get past 3.6%, we're smaller than 3.6% of the original network, convergence is starting to slow down as the, as the optimization process is breaking down. So now, to contrast much more clearly, 
Let's look at what happens when you reinitialize. So this orange line is reinitialization. And so now we can actually see quite the difference. When we're looking at accuracy on the right, right we're seeing that this, this network very quickly actually starts to lose accuracy. You know, by the time we've lost 60% of the parameters, we're actually starting to lose accuracy of our network and we're no longer matching the original. Now on the left-hand side, right, we can also see as well, we, we just get dramatic um, loss in, in convergence. This is actually not optimizing nearly as well as, as the subnetworks that we're finding using our technique. Right? So this is, these are the base results and the observations that we've been able to take from you know, our technique and then the, applying our technique to a variety of different networks are that within dense trainable networks, so these large neural networks, we can actually find these small trainable subnetworks that are actually equally as capable, right? And equally capable, we mean reach the same accuracy in at most the same number of iterations. And as well, so this lottery ticket, the, the hypothesis, why this was named this way as well is we call these these networks that we find, these subnetworks we find, we call them you know, winning tickets. If you conceptualize, let's say, SGD as perhaps this lottery ticket of this, this lottery process, where there are you know, combinatorially many subnetworks that are inside of this large network, we're finding one that was lucky, that was well initialized, uh, and actually trains as well as the larger network uh, in composition. So that's where that's where the name come from, and this is the the more this is the instantiation. If you read into the paper, um, and we've certainly refined this as well since then from this you know, this high level uh, claim that we have here. So okay, so now so this is these as I said before, refer small networks. So small networks, thinking about smaller tasks such as CIFAR, MNIST, um, and but in recent results and some results that are actually out this week in ICML. If you wanted to take a look at that presentation and join in in that presentation session, we'll be on shoot tomorrow, actually. Um, and what we're seeing in our results is that we can actually look at broader context. So this is for even larger models for CIFAR 10, uh, but also looking at ImageNet. So looking at you know, classic ResNet 50 style models. And our observations have been, so inside of this, we actually, we developed some new metrics and measures to actually measure properties of the optimization landscape uh, of neural networks. And what we actually find are there are specific properties that distinguish when a lottery ticket or one of these subnetworks exists or emerge in a network uh, versus when it does not. And the overall hypothesis or the overall observations that we've taken away is that in small networks, as we saw before, this occurs right at initialization. You can find these subnetworks using our technique at initialization. But for larger networks, this occurs earlier in training. There's a, there's a small amount that the first initial stages of training seem to be very chaotic in the sense that that original initialization has no bearing on the final trajectory, let's say, uh, of the optimization trajectory. So if you actually apply our procedure at initialization, you actually don't find as good as results as we'd seen in the smaller networks. However, if you wait, let's say 5%, so 5% into training, a very small amount into training, and then apply our procedure then, uh, it suddenly everything reemerges again. It seems like 5% into training, there's, there's the settling that happens where these small networks exist yet again. And in principle, at that point, if you could identify that, you could train just with that small network and finish out the rest of training with that small network. Right? So our current understanding, to summarize these types of results, is that early in training, there exists small, sparse subnetworks that train or that reach the same accuracy as the full network. And again, early in training, but and it's also very, very early in training. 5% uh, if you're looking at you know, ResNet 50 uh, on ImageNet. So, so this is our current understanding of this, of this phenomenon. And so there's this good question. These are great, you know, interesting empirical results. You know, and what, what can we do with these? You know, how can we uh, make these more practical and apply to modern concerns that we have in deep learning? And that's where we've, we in the community, other people have taken up this charge, have actually started to investigate a number of different methods to um, weaponize, as some people may call it, but actually take these results and make them practical. So as I mentioned, PU networks early in training, right? This would be an ideal goal. Add initialization, we identify the subnetwork and just simply train uh, with this, with this subnetwork. Uh, looking for better efficiency. Now, this is this is you know a grand goal, and I'll return to this at the end of the talk. It's something that we are working on, and many people are working on. And there's been very interesting initial results, but we're still not there. Um, you know, our our retroactive identification of these subnetworks still sets the bar for the smallest networks that we know to exist right now. 
uh, of some of these larger networks, right? So that's one. But another one is actually post-training pruning techniques. So as I talked about at the very beginning, in the background, training for inference. This is actually some place where we've got some results. And then finally, also transferring winning tickets to new tests. So let me talk about these later too. So in some recent results that we had in iClear this past year, we actually showed that this resetting, training your network, pruning it, and then resetting its weights back to the very beginning of, of training um, or early into training uh, is actually a very promising and powerful pruning technique where there's been a lot of recent literature in state-of-the-art techniques for pruning of getting the smallest model uh, for competitive or contemporary accuracy for that particular model. Uh, and what we're seeing is, is just a wide variety of techniques. So this, this black dot that I have plotted here, um, so here we're looking at the compression ratio being model size. And on the left-hand side, we're looking at the change in accuracy, uh, where ideally we want you know, zero or, or above in our change in accuracy where we're matching or improving accuracy. And so this result here, this black dot, this is uh, some work actually that came out of Song Hans group as well, where they're looking at using reinforcement learning based techniques, very sophisticated technique that actually will, you know, basically observe and monitor the behavior of the network and identify uh, per layer, what is the appropriate way to perhaps prune that model. Um, and what we've been able to find is that we can actually um, remove the need for a lot of that complexity by actually using this very simple training procedure that we've had where one thing that is challenging in this space when you're thinking about pruning uh, just for inference is how do you organize training for that, that second phase? After I've thrown away weights in my model, do I use the same learning procedure, training procedure that I had before? You know, what's my learning rate schedule? What is my optimizer? All these become questions again. And so when you actually apply our technique, what we show is that you actually you can reuse the hyperparameters that you had to the initial stages of training on the full model, and that actually dramatically improves results um, versus other techniques um, on that second phase of, of improving um, of improving accuracy of a pruned model for fine tuning. So, so those are the those are the results there that we had, um, and we've seen those actually be very promising. Uh, now. There's another result as well as so a transfer. So recently, there was some work on using, um, so there's some work on using pruning to actually transfer small networks to other tasks, right? So how does this work? So think about it in the setting. So I had mentioned the process that we're using right now is you know, expensive. We're finding these things retroactively. So while we do end up with a small network, it's actually you know, an expensive process that we're going to to find it. Um, so we're not accelerating training on the given task. But let's say that we find this small subnetwork. What we can do is transfer it to another task or perhaps to another domain and then accelerate learning or training in that domain. Uh, and so recently, some work that came out of um, Facebook this past year, Neurops this past year, they looked at this. So for example, finding these small subnetworks um, or these winning tickets uh, on something like CFAR and then transferring the results over to SVHN quite successfully. Um, and we have well have actually started to look at this in other domains. So we have been looking more recently uh, at, this, at these results uh, inside of NLP, actually looking at large pre-trained BERT models where, again, this is the space where we're looking at some of the largest models that are out there. Uh, and oftentimes how training in this space works is that you train an incredibly large model on, on an unsupervised task, such as a, a mass language modeling task. Uh, and then you take that large unsupervised model and then you go and adapt it to actually use it for a specific task that you have in mind, such as sentiment analysis, for example. And what you'll do is you'll fine tune that model given some supervised data for your particular task. So in this setting, we can start to ask these questions of, well, you do this first initial massive pre-training and then in our fine tuning setting, what if we, we can ask a couple of questions. One, if we find sub networks on a particular fine tune task, does that transfer to another task for fine tuning, uh, another NLP task, right? And then as well, we can ask, uh, you know, can we find tickets that actually transfer between all tasks? So we could actually perhaps accelerate learning in many different domains or tasks in uh, typically fine tuning tasks that we might have. And so in some of these results that we've had, we've actually been able to show a couple things. One is that these subnetworks do actually specifically tune to tasks. So it does seem as though they're identifying task specific or domain specific uh, features uh, that allow them to train well. So actually, so if you make them small enough, they do not transfer between tasks. 
However, if you do find the small subnetwork using a very small fine-tuning task that is just the same as the original unsupervised task, that actually transfers well. So in fact, you can actually find uh, what we'd call as a, a, you know, a subnetwork that transfers well to many different domains um, in this setting. So this has been a promising result, another promising result towards minimizing um, or amortizing uh, the cost of training these networks or of identifying these networks and still being able to get some sort of improvement on a wide variety of different tasks. So now, finally, let me talk about you know, pruning early and training. This is where I want to wrap up. So pruning early, how do we think about this? This is, this is you know, the core question. We've actually started some, uh, some new initial projects and have some interesting results in this space, um, but people as well have also been in this space uh, along with us looking for results. And so let me organize this space and tell you where we stand. So we can think about a measure of you know, the quality of, let's say, an early pruning technique by looking at a plot that looks like this. So here's the idea. On the x-axis, we are plotting. This is going to be epics of training. So just like training iterations, we can just partition this into epics. Um, and we can observe at any given point how many weights are we using in the model at any given point in time. And so our standard training process is going to be this blue line that we have at the top, where at every given point of training, we are using 100% of the original weights, right? No pruning has happened. This is the unpruned model. Right? So now if you look at other results that are in the, in the space, there's a concept called gradual pruning, where the idea is that you execute with your full model for some time. And then at some point during training, you start to gradually throw away weights. And so these are some state-of-the-art results that were done in 2019, and there are other results in this space, variational dropout, if that, if, if that rings a bell to you, as well as L0 regularization, there are a couple papers on this concept as well, and they all have roughly the same shape. Um, but what we're starting to see is that this gradual pruning is going to be an improvement in the sense that if you look at the area under this curve, it's going to be smaller than that for the unpruned network. So we're, overall, we're going to be executing with fewer weights through the course of training. So now, so that's this is you know a good starting point and a good organizational framework giving some ex existing results. Now, a strong baseline, you know, somewhat surprisingly, is just randomly throwing away some weights right at the very beginning of training or thinking about initialization. All right, so this is this is where that line shows up right now. If you start to look at some of our results, where you can throw away you know somewhere between eighty and sixty percent of the weights in the model at the very beginning of training and just use those through the course of training and still end up with an, a network that's roughly the same as the original, right? So now, where do our results stand? What do we see based on some of the contemporary results that we have? Well, we see this. What it says is 5% into training. You can actually, if you could identify it, which we're still working on, you would be able uh, to cut your model down to about 15, 10 to 15% the size of the original, and then continue training through the rest of training with these results. All right, so this is the limit. Again, this limit is established retroactively, but given our available techniques right now, this is what we know is possible. And so the opportunity that we're trying to exploit and everyone's looking for is getting between this gap between random pruning, and then let's say what we're finding with our, our technique, our lottery ticket technique. And so there's been some very interesting promising results that have actually started to come out in the past you know, few months um, and year uh, where people have looked at pruning at initialization. And so far, these results look like this. They're sort of pushing the line a little bit down, getting down more towards 50%, but still not making all that much progress, right? There's still a significant gap between these results and the results we're seeing are possible, you know, in principle with our technique. And so this is where we have been spending our time trying to characterize the space um, and potentially propose and propose some, some new techniques hopefully in, in the next months or year. So to conclude and to wrap up here, the basic takeaway is that early in training, there actually are some sparse, small sparse subnetworks that reach the same accuracy as the full network. Uh, and this has implications for sparse training during standard training or transfer learning or even for fine tuning. And there's still open challenges out there. So clearly, as I mentioned, early pruning, actually demonstrating and realizing on this result that we're seeing so far, as observation we're seeing so far, is an active field of research. People are still working aggressively to figure out what we can do. And as well, so something that I hinted at before, 
uh, is thinking about, let's say, you know, the performance concerns. So if you, so my background, I come traditionally and classically from systems and programming languages um, and thinking about efficient software systems. And if you've had any experience working with uh, software systems and hardware systems for sparse linear algebra uh, or, or just sparse structures, uh, you know that reducing parameter count or making a smaller model in an unstructured way arbitrary points throughout the network does not necessarily directly mean improved performance. So there's a lot of work to be done here, a lot of interesting work to be done here in thinking about new software hardware platforms that are designed for sparse training. Um, so sparse, or sparse inference and sparse training. And this is, you know, it's been great. These, we are working on some of these results coming out of my group and in collaborations with some of my colleagues uh, on pure compiler side and on the hardware side. Uh, and even well, um, NVIDIA has had you know, great results that have been coming out actually uh, looking at better sparse support, sparse GPU, sparse GPU support in its standard Ku sparse library, for example. And as well as the new Ampere architecture that's coming out has support for a very peculiar but, but starting to support um, sparse structures, um, doing sparse computation natively in hardware. And so these are great improvements where we're seeing even commodity hardware is moving in a direction where they are motivated to exploit uh, the promise that we're seeing here. So that's it, you know, I'll wrap up there. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent, and we do have a few questions for you, Michael. Um, the, the first was uh, early on in the talk, you were, um, you were uh, discussing um, superfluous um, nodes and uh, obviously, um, given where you've taken the, the pruning, um, defining what exactly is superfluous is going to be the, the critical element. Um, what, what does the research tell us and, and what is the, uh, the space, uh, the research space around trying to decide the best way to identify those superfluous nodes? Is it magnitude? Is it gradient? Is there something else that informs and, and where can we expect this research to take us in the next few years? So it is, I think there are, I'd say there are two contemporary ways of, of thinking about pruning, let's say in the, in the weight concept. Uh, so I'd say one is just looking at magnitude, or actually, well, let me take a step back there. Uh, one is I look at, so I'm making a decision to remove a weight, and I want to be able to come up with a quick approximation of the potential effect of removing that weight on the loss right, the, the loss of, of the network. And so one way that people do this is by taking just a simple uh, Taylor approximation of a loss, typically a second order approximation. Uh, and then what you'll find is a couple things pop out when you do that. Uh, you'll see that your, your metric is composed of the magnitude of the weight, uh, typically the gradient falling on the weight, and then often uh, the Hessian. So second order properties of, of the loss landscape in its relation to the network as well. And so, this is a great framework to think about because there are a variety of techniques that look at any three of these quantities or subsets thereof. And it's an open question right now of which is the best. So right now we are actually seeing in results that we're running that just looking at weight magnitude seems to do just as well as fancier techniques that are also incorporating the gradient or the Hessian. Um, and there are some contemporary hypotheses out there that the reason why that may be true is uh, because of, let's say, the, the poorness of the approximation in the Hessian. So typically using a Hessian approximation methods when you're trying to calculate uh, these types of salient metrics. So there are some researchers out there that are looking better at better Hessian. Origin. So I'd say that that's one characteristic. So you just take some Taylor approximation of the loss. If something, if removing a weight is going to affect the loss too much, then I don't want to touch it. I want to only remove things that don't change the loss too much. Now, there have been other techniques that have been coming out more recently, and I'd say they're starting to look at higher order, I might call it a higher order property loss, where what you're going to look at is instead, I'm gonna look at the network and I wanna reason about uh, its optimization behavior. So I wanna remove weights uh, that, that if removed will not affect the optimization trajectory of the network, right? And this seems like a reasonable concept when you think about, we want to do this at the beginning of training versus at the end of training, where at the end of training, there's no more optimization that's left to be done for some definition. And so there's a whole class of techniques organized in that space that's been coming out as well. And so some of the techniques I flashed two slides ago are in that space. Uh, so SynFlow, GRASP, 
for example. Um, and we've been thinking about some results in that space as well. So I think you know, broadly, I think people are going to start asking, you know, what are desirable properties that I'd like to be true of a prune network? And they're going to find ways to remove weights that do not affect that property. So that's how, I, that's how I'd characterize it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, one uh, slightly related question. Um, in your retrospective analysis, you've seen that uh, printing the networks can give you just as high or maybe higher accuracy slightly, um, much more uh, efficient training. Um, it, it is retrospective, but have you done a, a sort of a post-mortem on those pruned networks? Are there clues that start to suggest potentially entire features that might not be relevant to the initial uh, composition of the network or um, certain layers that might uh, disappear entirely? Um, anything, uh, any higher order structure you've been able to observe? So this is a great question. Uh, so we've done some limited analysis of the patterns of sparsity uh, that we're seeing arise in these networks. And I'll say, you know, at the moment, it is hard to pick out you know, anything truly conceptual, right? Um, so one thing that does has, you know, if you want to think in the convolutional setting, um, I, there are cases where what you end up finding is that our technique will throw away, let's say, entire channels. There are entire channels of the network that just get thrown away because they're, they're largely irrelevant as far um, as our you know, pruning heuristic can find out. Uh, and as well through the iterative process, right? And so that's actually something as well that's interesting where if you compare uh, the results that we get with this technique of you know, resetting versus some of the more contemporary or the more classic techniques of let's say going forward with these same weights when you're talking about doing pruning for inference where our technique seems to find much more structured networks. So networks uh, where more full channels, for example, or full filters have been thrown away uh, than what you might get if you used a more classic technique. Um, so it may, may be identifying coarser grained features to throw away uh, mm -hmm. than classic techniques. But this is, I'd say there's, there's a lot of work to be done here. Uh, my student as well, so Jonathan Frankel is a fantastic student that's you know, done this line share of the work that's going on here. You know, it's always about the students. Um, and he has, you know, he's done some, some studies as well on interpretability. And trying to see, you know, if you take standard interpretability metrics about neural networks, uh, and then apply them to the prune neural networks, do we see different observations, right? And mm -hmm. so far, he's finding that these networks are about equally interpretable. You perhaps hope that the sparse networks are more interpretable. We don't have evidence there yet, or he doesn't have evidence there yet. Um, but there's at least some initial investigation there, I'd say. And people who are interested in this, in this perspective of trying to interpret what particular structures are doing. Uh, and reason about their interaction with pruning as well. Excellent. Well, I think with that, we're at time. So thank you very much, Michael. Very interesting work. And I can't wait to see where it takes us over the next couple of years. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for being with us for today's session. Um, you've seen some uh, really cutting edge, interesting research. And uh, please be certain to join us on Thursday. Uh, at the same time for the next session in this series. Have a great day.